Okay, so let us continue what we started last time about flexural members like beans. And we're going to be addressing here non composite beans. As we said here, we're going to have a demand and, of course, and a capacity. Come to demand when it comes to it, uh, we're going to be using the load factors because we're going to be doing the trend design or a lot of the design. We're not going to be doing the ASD design. So I'm going to skip this slide, number three. I'm going to go here to slide number four. And the slide number four, as you see here, that we have few load combinations. And since we're going to be doing only gravity for this design, I'm going to be considering the first and the second load combinations only. So what I have here, I may have 1.4 dead versus 1.2 dead plus 1.6 line. How about the rest of the loads? Uh, F, for example, is gonna be like for fluid. If you have a water tank, H is gonna be soil pressure, snow and rain. We don't have any of that in our design. Window seismic, we're not gonna have it for the specific slide set. Uh, we have here one example. So the example here, just to determine the demand, demand is gonna be moment and shear. Based on this, Previous example 1.1 from the previous slide set. The ultimate load was determined to be 2.09 kilolinear foot. We're going to be taking this load and based on this, we can find out the moment demand based on the load demand. So this is going to be W ultimate, this is going to be also M ultimate and V ultimate. M ultimate, this is going to be the moment demand, W squared divided by 8. This span was given here at 33 feet squared times the load, output load, divided by eight, and here's a moment demand. Shear demand is gonna be equal to the load multiplied by the span divided by two, which means the reaction. As you see, it's gonna be like 34 and a half kips. So this is just to make it simple when it comes to demand. So we start here by giving the demand and just one example on it. Now let's see the capacity. What does it mean by capacity? We talked about this top flange braced. And we say when the top flange braced, the bucking length of this top flange is going to be equal to almost zero. And in a case like this, moment capacity, because the section here is going to be fully plasticized, top flange is braced. But actually, I should have said compression flange is braced, which is a top flange in this case. Your moment capacity is going to be equal to the fee factor, the point line, multiplied by yield strength, F sub y, based on the steel material that you're going to be taken up, multiplied by the Z, which is the section, section models. You can just look it up from the steel tape properties. When it comes to shear strength, I'm gonna have this simple equation. Usually once you see here a shear design, we don't really use F sub Y, we usually use 0.6 F sub Y. We have here a factor of, it's gonna be the factor, depends on the steel section. So it's either it's gonna be 0.9 or it's gonna be 1.0. C sub V here is a shear factor that we're gonna see the value for it. And AW is gonna be the cross section area resisting the shear, area of the web. Area of this web is gonna be equal to T of the web multiplied by the total depth. Some people by mistake would just use this section, this cross section area with this depth only. And this is incorrect. We should use entire depth multiplied by the width thickness. So let me bring it here. This gave you now the width thickness. This gave you the shear, uh, the, the shear area or area exposed to shear. This gave you TW multiplied by the total depth. So I guess now I have AW, I have F sub Y. The question is gave you about phi sub V and C sub V. These two values, usually phi sub V and C sub V is gonna be equal to one. Unless you have one of the following sections, was grade 50. So if the grade is 50, which means F sub Y is gonna be equal to 50 KSI, and you have one of these sections, your phi sub V is gonna be equal to 0.9, and most likely we're not gonna be hitting any of these sections. We'll avoid them as much as we can. Any questions at this point? You're good? So to summarize here, 
you like to do a beam design. Ooh, are you there? Yes, we're here. Yes. Uh, go ahead, please, and turn on your camera. Yeah. There we go. All right. So to summarize this, when it comes to strength design of beams, I have here two items that I need to satisfy. The first one is called the flexure strength. Second one is giving the shear strength. If you are able to satisfy both of these two conditions, which means if you are able to confirm the PMF and PVM, the problem is going to be larger than their demand. For example, PMF is going to be larger than M sub U, and PVM is going to be larger than V sub U. It means your beam is strong enough to support the loop. It doesn't mean your design is complete yet, or your design is perfect. You still have one more step, which is serviceability design. You need to check your deflection. So the first two items is just check the strength. You want to be sure that the beam is strong enough. The third item, you'd like to see the deflection. You don't want this beam to deflect a lot. Otherwise, people's going to be scared and they're going to be feeling unsafe in this place right below this beam. When you have uniform load and the simply supported beam, deflection equation is given as five times uniform load times L to the four divided by 384 EI. This gave you the amount of energy. So actually this factor is not in the equation. If you open any structural analysis book, you're not gonna see the 1728. But we have an issue here with units. We wanna be sure that we are consistent. If this W is gonna be, let's say, pound per foot, Let's say this length needs to be in feet. This E is not going to be in case sign. It's going to be in kit per square foot. And this moment of inertia is going to be in foot to the four. Now let's look what is available. Usually E is going to be available in case sign. This is what we usually have, right? We memorize this value and this is what we use. Moment of inertia, when you open the steel manual in the section properties, it's going to be all in inches of form. So I know that this is going to be in KSI and this is going to be in inches of form. Now let's look for W. W is going to be kept per foot. So now I see everything here when it comes to force is going to be in kips. So this is good. E is going to be in KSI, kept per square inch. And here W is going to be kept per foot. Now I have here some trouble. For units, in the bottom here, I have it inches. When you go here to the top, I have it this as a kipper foot, and the span is usually provided to you in feet. You're not going to convert the span into inches to work with this equation. You would rather keep this in feet and keep W to be kipper foot, keep E to be in KSI, and keep the moment of inertia to be in inches of foot. How can you make this work? So I'm going to say here, maybe you need some conversion factors, right? And these factors, I just put them all in one place. So this 1728 actually is equal to 12 to the 3. So if you take 12 times 12 times 12, it's going to get to year 1728. So this 1728 is not originally part of the equation. It's just the factor that I added specifically in this slide to make it easy if you like to do the flexion analysis without looking at units of these loads and stain and E and R. So if the load is going to be given to you as in kipper foot and the span is going to be feet, E is going to be in KSI, long of inertia, I is going to be inches of four, right, of the table, you can just use this formula here and your deflection is going to be in inches. So your deflection here is the end result, not going to be in feet, it's going to be actually in inch. I said, okay. So I guess with that, I can figure out how much deflection this beam is going to be deflected under dead load and life load. Because I have two load 
that I need to consider. These two loads, one of them is called dead load, the other one's gonna be life load. So what should I do after this? Now this is up to, or according to the impulse here, dead load and life load, I'm gonna have this much deflection in inches. Now you need to compare it with the code limit. Code limits, when it comes to life load, deflection is gonna be equal to the span divided by 360. Meaning this deflection here in inches, you need to compare it with the span in inches divided by 360. So let's just imagine for a second here that I have a span of 30 feet. How much is gonna be the level life load deflection? Can someone help with that? Yeah, say here 30 feet. I'd like to see it in inches. How much is this? Can you help, please? I have 30 foot span. How much is that in inches? 360. 360. Okay. Now, once you divide by 360, what's going to be that level life load deflection? One inch. One inch. Very good. So for a 30 foot span, steel beam, a level deflection due to life load only is going to be equal to 300. 60 is going to be the span divided by 360, meaning it's going to be one inch. You say, do I have another limit? Yes, here's a second limit. It says deflection due to total load. What does it mean by total load? Dead load plus life load is going to be equal to the span, which again is going to be 360 divided by 240. How much is that? One point five. One point five. So deflection here for a third foot span due to life load only is gonna be an inch. And for the total load is gonna be one and a half inch. How about for dead load only? We can say code doesn't have a limit for life for dead load only. So you have actually two limits. One of them is gonna be for only life load, the second one is gonna be for total load. Did load plus life. With that, you can say that you are done with your beam design and analysis. So it's gonna be here, we're gonna have two main steps. The first step is composed of two items, which is strength design, flexure capacity, shear capacity. The second step is gonna be deflection check, which means serviceability. You'd like to see that this beam is gonna be in good shape, it's not deflecting that much. In some cases, we add another item here to the serviceability check, to the deflection, which is gonna be vibration. And we're gonna be covering it in this course. Mm -hmm. You don't want this beam to be vibrating a lot, especially if you have a jam or if you have um, like a mole, for example, and you have lots of traffic, people's gonna be moving around. You don't want them to feel that the floor is shaking. Okay, let's do an example. Uh, professor, yes. Um, so I I think in like wood the the um allowable deflections for roof was like a little different, right? Is this the same for steel? Say the same thing. I'm sorry about the deflection. Um, yeah, the allowable deflections, right? For I think in wood design, like the roof is um 180 and 240 or something like that. It's um I was wondering if it was the same for steel for for the roof or like regular floor levels. No, for structure steel. This can be the, the limits that we use. Okay, for it doesn't um, matter if it's the roof level or the floor level. No, no, it doesn't matter for roof or floor. It's giving the same thing. Right? We just use the same thing. Cool, thank you. Okay. So let's see here an example. Um, it says top flange brace beam. So we have good news here. The top flange is braced, fully braced meaning that phi man is gonna be equal to the point line, the phi factor multiplied by z factor multiplied by the f sub one. And it says here, it is used to support the load of 80 PSF. So the load here is 80 pound per square foot. Life load is 50 PSF. 
Did it say that this gave me an office occupancy for office use? Does it say here? No, it doesn't. Would you do roof, roof reduction for that? Or live load reduction? I will not. This beam actually is taken from mechanical roof. I have a few equipment and useful mechanical rooms. Rooftop, we use 50 PSF and we don't reduce it. So in order for you to do a reduction of any given life load, you need to know the occupancy first. If you know that the occupancy is residential or business, like an office use, you can do reduction. If you don't know it and the life load is given to you, do not touch it, just use it as is. Other question, should I add 15 PSF for partition as life load? You can say no, don't. What triggered the 15 PSF last time? The fact that we had an office space. But in this case here, we don't have an office space. It just says, here's a life load. So no partitions. Why would you consider any partitions, right? No one gives you any information about partitions or occupancy. So you cannot come up with this additional 15 PSF. I said, okay. The steel use is A992. If you look here, the steel table A992, you can figure out if sub Y and if sub U, ultimate. So in this case, it says here grade 50, so F sub Y is going to be equal to 50 KSI. Tributary width for this beam is 10 feet. Okay. While the span is 30 feet. So now I know the span, I know tributary width. It says here, determine the most economic. What does it mean by most economic? It means the lighter W16 by or W18 by beam size. Please give you one of these two beams to make it work. Now, in this case, I need to check the strength, flexure, shear, and of course, deflection. I need to check the three. Now, I need to figure out diddle. Where do you get the dead load from? It says here 80 pounds per square foot with tributary width of 10 feet. So find out the load as a pound per linear foot or kip per linear foot. You take the uniform load as in PSF, multiply by 10 feet. So here we go. You're going to be taking here 10 feet tributary width, as we see it right here. And look this value here of the load. I said here 0.08 KSF. What is 0.08? Means 80 pounds per square foot. I'd rather put it as a kip per foot. Why is that? I'm gonna take you back here a few slides and look at this. Usually load is gonna be as a kip per foot. Look at this moment, moment value that I've been, that I have used here in the previous example. Everything was in kips and feet when it comes to moment and shear, correct? So I'd rather keep it as a kip per foot. So now I have the dead load to be 0.8 kip linear foot. Same thing with the life load. I'm going to be taking it 50. I'm not going to change it. Look at this 50. Just divide here by 1,000. I'm not going to reduce it. I'm not going to add this 15 piece after because this is not an offer. But by, by the same tributary width, get here 0.5. Now, what is a design load? Can I just add both of these two values and say this is going to be the design load? I said, no, this is just the service load, total service load. Is this what you're going to be using as W ultimate? I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say use 1.4 dead versus 1.2 dead plus 1.6 life. So, why do I need this total service load? What's the use of it? Can I say, look at this. When you do here deflection, we didn't use any factor tools, correct? It says here, allowable for life load. It says here, allowable for total load. What's total load? It's gonna be total service, which means just dead load plus life load, no load factors. So when you do serviceability check, you don't magnify the loads. You just use them as is. You're gonna use them as service loads. This is the reason that in one step here, I just added the two and I'll say we find out W total service load, just for the flexible check. Okay. 
How about W alt move? Now I need factor loop to do my transition. So here we go. I have 1.4 times there versus 1.2 there plus 1.6 live. Now, which one gives you higher here value? Look at this 112 versus 176. This is getting controlled here by design. 1.76 Kipling in effort. Very similar to what I have done in the example presented in this slide set. Can be finding out the moment. It's going to be W squared divided by eight. Here's the moment demand, the M ultimate. And the shear demand is going to be this 26.4, just W L divided by two. So I'm done kind of the first section of finding out the demand on the B. Questions? I cannot hear you. If anyone is speaking, Mark, are you speaking? No, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so I said, okay, now I'm done with the first step, finding the demand. Now I need the capacity. Okay, let me try this beam. Because if you look at the steel table, the lightest. The most efficient 16 by beam is gave you W16 by 26. But I know it's not going to work. All right. So I said, let me start with the first beam that I think is going to work. You're going to be taking this beam W16 by 31. You can open the steel table, find out the Z factor, and the Z factor is 54 inch cube. Okay. Okay, let me find out phi man. It's going to be equal to 0.9, the phi factor times 50 KSI, yield strength, apply by 54. Why should I divide by 12 here? Because if you look at the three values, P is unitless. 50 is gonna be in kip per square inch. This F sub Y, this is gonna be here. ZX is gonna be inch cube. So actually, if you did not divide by 12, you'll end up with a moment which is gonna be in kip inch. Correct? If you look here at units, this here unitless is gonna be 50 k psi, 54 inch cube. So if you did not divide here by 12, your moment would have been in kip inch. But I don't want kip inch. It comes to moment. You remember the moment I just determined here that was in kip foot. So to make a good comparison between the two, I'm gonna divide here this by 12, it's gonna be 202.5 kip foot. Your demand is 198. So this is good. You have gone beyond the demand. Okay. Just hit it. This gave me very good design. If this beam is good, this gave me really very strong because our capacity is slightly right over the demand. All right. Okay. How about the shear? Said, well, also look at the steel table. Look at this whip thickness, it's 0.275 inch. Look at the depth, 15.5. For Debbie 16 by 31, the depth is not really 16 inch. You know, it is nominal to be 16 inch. So I'm going to be taking a 15 line off the table. Now, FVN for this beam section. I don't here have a problem. PVN is going to be equal to one and C sub V is going to be equal to one. So I didn't show it here. So your PVN is going to be equal to 6% of F sub Y, 6% of 50 K sign. You multiply by AW, which means T times D. Here's the T, here's the D. You have big capacity, 131 Kips, more than 26.4. Where's the 26.4 coming from? You can say coming from this demand. 26.4. So look at this. This moment is kind of tight. It's right there. And you have much bigger capacity than shear. That's why we call this flexion member. In very short beam, you may have different understanding, right? Because the moment is a moment capacity, is a moment demand, it's gonna be much larger. So in a case like this, this is going to be flexor here. Remember, in beams, generally speaking, we don't have a problem with the shear. Usually, we have a problem with flexor, 
which means moment and deflection. Are we good at this point? Yes? Great. Okay, let's check deflection here. So here's what happened. I checked deflection for W16 by 31. It's not good. I did 16 by 36. It's not good. I did 16 by 40. Oh, now it's coming heavier. So I look at the W18 by. Why? Because if you look back here at this problem, it says W16 or W18. So I say, once I get there, I said here, I have a beam size of W18 by 35. When you compare it to W16 by 36, this is actually lighter and it's gonna be deeper, which means it's stronger. I said, okay. This beam here is gonna be stronger than W16 by 31. It's gonna be deeper and heavier. So for sure, the female for the W16 18 by 35 is gonna be larger than the demand. So I know for sure that this beam is gonna be stronger, so I don't really need to do another check for the flexure. Also, I don't need to do another check for the shear. I know that I'm gonna be okay with that. Why? Because I brought a heavier beam, bigger, deeper, and heavier in weight. So okay, now let me check the flexure for this beam. If you remember the equation, it says five WL to the four, divided by 384 EI. Here is five. Here is L to the four. Here is 1728, the load factor. Someone's gonna say, how come this load factor is not in this equation? You say, because it shouldn't be in this equation. This is just a conversion factor. So that's why I did not put it in this equation. So I'm just gonna put it in here, 1728. So I have here, Five times L to the four, just multiplied by W. I didn't put the value for W. And here's my reason. If you remember, I'm gonna be doing two checks. One of them is gonna be for life load and the other one's gonna be for total load. So I'd like to clear all of this constants and just wait for the W to be used. I'm gonna show you here this in a second. Divided by 384, divided by E, 29,000 divided by 510. Where is this 510 coming from? It's gonna be a moment of inertia of this steel beam from the steel table. Okay. I'm gonna clean this equation. I'm gonna end up with deflection is gonna be equal to 1.23 times the weight or W. And this W is gonna be actually in kip per foot, right? So you see this is here, this W is gonna be kip per foot, right? We come to units. And with that, I'm going to have deflection in inches. Now I made the equation much easier because I don't want to repeat this equation and redo all of this analysis again. So, okay. Here is deflection for total load. It's going to be equal to 1.23 times W total. How much is W total? I'm going to go back here, slide. W total is 1.3. W life load is 0.5 from this one. All right, let me use here 1.3. So what is this 1.3 again? This is gonna be the total load. What do you get out of that? It's gonna be 1.6 inches. But good, why? Because compare this total deflection, compare it with the span divided by 240. You remember this, that was exactly the span I gave you guys and you did it with me. Total load deflection, the allowable is gonna be one and a half inch. For life load, it's gonna be an inch. You guys helped me with this, right? Look at this. Deflection due to total load is gonna be 1.6 inches. So this is not good. This beam fails. It does not satisfy the requirement for deflection. It just deflects a lot. Look at the life load deflection. 1.23 times W life load, 0.5 is gonna be 0.6 inches. This is good. So the problem that I have here is gonna be with total deflection. So what should I do? Go to the next size. 
moment of inertia, 612. This is big jump, right? Like 20% from 510 to 612. I increase the moment of inertia by a lot. Now, guess what's going to happen to this equation? Just take the 510, put what? Put the 612. This means as if you take this deflection here, divide by how much? This one, by 1.2 because you pump the amount of inertia by 20%. If you run your analysis this way, your deflection due to total load is gonna be 1.33. Now this is good, this is gonna be low less than one and a half inch, right? So this beam is gonna be okay, it's gonna work well. Do I need to check the life load deflection? Well, if a beam was 510 amount of inertia is working, why not the 612? 612 inches of forward mountain inertia. So for sure this guy will fine. So this beam size at the end, I ended up with W team by 40. To conclude here, if you just look at the strength, W16 by 31 is working fine. If you like to consider deflection and complete your design, actually W18 by 40 is the beam that you should use. Now someone says, is there a way that maybe I can keep the smaller beam like this W18 by 35 or this beam W16 by 31 since it's good in strength and do something about deflection? Yes, yeah, yeah, you can do camber. How would you do camber? Let's say I'd like to use this beam here, the W16 by 31. Deflection is not good. Okay. Or let's say I'd like to use this W18 by 35. My problem is gonna be in total deflection. Now, do you have an issue with the life of deflection? No. I'm just give you the total <laughs> deflection, which means a did load component. Okay. Now I need your help here to tell me how much is the deflection due to dead load. Can someone help me with this? Do you know how much is the dead load first? Yes, no. Dead load was right here, 0.8. How much is deflection due to dead load? How much is it? A little under an inch. Like, can you tell me exactly? I got 0 0.984. 0 0.84. So how did you do it? You did 1.23 times 0.8, right? So you can see here it's gave you 0 0.5. Inch. Okay. So once you put this beam in the floor system, it's gonna be deflecting roughly an inch, correct? So what I'm thinking, what's gonna happen if I'm gonna do camber to the beam? You know, camber, which is opposite of deflection. So I'm gonna say, use camber of, let's say, half inch. What's gonna happen? Just camber it by half inch. So before you put the loads, the beam is gonna be having a negative deflection or cambered it by half an inch. Now you put all the dead load on it. Deflection due to dead load is giving an inch. You subtract half an inch because you start with negative and half an inch. So now deflection due to dead load, if you like, so I'm gonna say D here, right? D to dead load is giving you how much? It's giving you one inch and then you subtract one inch. Where does the one inch come from? This deflection due to dead load. You subtract the camber. So the final, you guess here final. It's gonna be equal to how much? It's gonna be one minus 0.5. It's gonna be equal to 0.5 inch. So great. How about deflection due to life load? You can see here deflection due to life load is how much? There is not like final, just one value that you can start with, right? That we start with from the beginning. Deflection due to life load is 0.615.
Now total deflection after camber is gave equal to 0.5 plus 0.615. How much is this? This gave you 1.115 inch. This is gonna be less than one and a half inch. You see good. So I kept, if you remember, all of this analysis was W18 by 35. So I kept this beam size here, and I was able to overcome this deflection problem by camber the beam before I start construction, the fabrication. And this helped a lot. Maybe I could have done the same thing with W16 by 31, but I'm just showing here some way out of it. You don't really need Continuum on the beam size? No, in many cases, we just do camber. Now, is camber kind of typical and standard? I'm going to say yes. It's very standard. Is there an additional cost for it? I'm going to say it's going to be minor. I just say camber the beam, don't worry about it. So, what camber value would you use? Let's give you the question, right? What camber values? I'm going to say, okay, let me put it here. I'm going to say camber. Can you camber it for quarter of an inch? Of course, you'd like to go to some good values. You're going to say, for example, half inch. So I'm going to say, yes, half inch to start with, right? Nothing less than half an inch. What's next? Can you do five eighth? You say, no, don't do five eighth. Half an inch, three quarter, one inch, one and quarter, and so forth. What's the maximum camber that you'd go with? maybe three inches, okay? This camber should not be larger than dead load deflection. Why is that? Because now you are building new construction and you put the beam. You don't wanna see the beam to camber out. You don't want this to happen. You want it to be at least to be flat. After I put the dead load, it's gonna be flat. I don't want the floor to be doing this, to be camped. So we're gonna say, if you like to do it, be sure that this value here, the camber that you put it there, is gonna be lower than dead load deflection. By a lot, some people would say, your camber here, this camber, when you do camber, right? Try to make it roughly three quarter of deflection due to dead load. Take it three quarter of this number. So if your deflection, I'm looking here, deflection due to dead load, how much was it? You say like an inch. I could have you three quarter of an inch. Don't go more than this. So I'm gonna say this is or equal. Half an inch is gonna be okay. If half an inch is gonna make it, don't make it three quarter. Let's give you the rule. Any questions? Okay, seems to work good. All right. Last example. This beam installed for example 3.2, the previous example. They installed 16 by 31. And there is no cam. I have looked at this beam before. I know 16 by 31 is good when it comes to flexure, to strength, right? Moment and to shear. My problem was deflection. And this beam is already installed. I cannot take it out and camber it. This gave you a problem, right? Because you have concrete deck on the top of it and you cannot do anything to it. Correct? You cannot camber it now. It's installed already. But you'd like to fix it. The contractor says, 
Why don't you add a steel plate here at the bottom? This is steel plate. What's going to do is going to increase the amount of inertia. And once you increase the amount of inertia, the flex of the beam is going to be cut down. So, okay, yeah, good idea. So the plate size is going to be half an inch by six inches. So section properties of this beam with the plate as one big section, it's going to get larger than amount of inertia. So your job here is to check the validity of this fix. Is this okay or it's not okay? So what you need to do is to look at this beam and to the steel plate all as one piece. First, you need to find out the centroid location. So if you remember centroid location, it's gonna be right here. We're gonna point out. Well, How do you find out the centroid? You're gonna have here two areas, area one and area two. Area one is 9.12 for the beam itself. Area two is gonna be the steel plate, three square inches, because it's gonna be six by one half. Total area is gonna be 12.12. Now you're gonna be taking the moment about the top or the bottom of the beam. So here we decide that you're gonna be taking about the top. Okay, start from here. This Y distance, which is Y1. Is a distance from the top flange all the way to the centroid of section number one, which means the CB. How much is that? You take 15.9, the total depth divided this by two, which is 17, 7.95. You say, how about the steel plate? You say, the steel plate is going to be equal to the total depth of the beam, which is this Y2. Look at this. It's going to be going all the way to the center here. So it's going to be equal to 15 line plus quarter of an inch to account for one half of the plate. Yeah, I have 16.15. How do you find out the centroid? You say A times Y, A times Y. Apply by this A times Y, the depth, A times Y. And then you find the total. Total is gonna be 120.95. Take this total divided by the total area. You're gonna get here this y star. What is this y star? It's gonna be a sub y total a sub y divided by total a. Give you this y star. What is y star? It's gonna be location of the global centroid for this two combined section, which is this why I start from here to there. It's good. What happened here, the centroid has dropped down a bit today. Great. Now I need to find out the new moment of inertia for this combined section. So the way it works, I'm going to find the area, the moment of inertia for this steel beam. It's going to be 375. And also the moment of inertia for this plate. I guess you can do it yourself. You can say B, the width is going to be 6 times half an inch cubed divided by 12. It's going to be like BH cubed divided by 12 for a rectangular section. But this is going to be very small. When you think about it, let me try this. This is going to be 6 multiplied by 0.5. Times 0.5 times 0.5 divided this by 12. This gave you 0.0625. This value here. You see this value here? It's gonna be very small for the plate itself. This gave you the amount of inertia of the plate itself. About its centroid. Let's say here is y bar. What is y bar? Y bar the distance from the new centroid to the centroid of each one of these two subsections. So from here to here is gonna be y bar one, it's gonna be y bar two. We can do this simple geometry, find out this y bar, and then the additional moment of inertia, to the basic moment of inertia, is gonna be equal to a times y bar squared. You add the total here for the total moment of inertia, and look, is going to be equal to 526.79. This is big improvement, right? Why? 
because you start this moment of inertia for the bare beam, just for the beam is gonna be 375. By adding this plate, it jumped to 526. It's very good. Now let's check here total deflection, see if it's gonna work. It is not. Look at 1.6 and look at this. And instead of taking the mean equation, we did this a small trick. What is this 1.6? What is a 510? What is a 526? Right? So I'm gonna roll it back and go back to this analysis. For this beam here, this equation with this loading and this is pan, the only difference is give you this moment of inertia. When I have here a moment of inertia of 510, I have a deflection of, look at this, 1.6. When I use this equation here. So you put here 510, you put total load of 1.3, what do you get? 1.6. So for the same beam, if I have moment of inertia again of 510, I have deflection of 1.6. So what happened here, if I change deflection, uh, change moment of inertia to 526, what's gonna happen here to deflection? So I'm gonna say 1.6 for 510, get divided by the new moment of inertia. It's gonna be 155, still not good. So what are the options that we have here? For sure, we're going to be adding the three quarter of an inch by eight inch, and this is going to be pumping this moment of inertia along. So, actually, the analysis of this beam with the new plate side three quarter of an inch by eight inch by adding this plate here to this steel beam is going to be kind of a homework for you, but not at this time. Is going to be no homework. Just look here at the homework available to you. Just give you homework number three. Have you guys seen it already? I yes. opened it up and looked at it a little bit. Okay, let me put it here. Oh, with that, I'm done with this lecture here. With this slide set, we are done for today. And um, let's go through this homework. This truss is getting made of square steel tools. You know the HSS? You have the HSS? You know which material is this? You can open the steel table and figure out the material that this steel tube is made of. How about the yield strength? Usually 46 KSI. Here again, look it up. It's gonna be called A500 steel tube, grade B. So you can look it up and paste on this. You can figure out which material to use with the HSS. It's going to be square, not rectangular. So my suggestion, you are going to be using here three by three or four by four and pick the thickness you want, okay? So it says number one, this is going to be here truss. Solve the truss for the three forces. F1, F2, and F3. We need to analyze the thrust and come up with the forces in the thrust due to this 100 kips. It says here, the height is gonna be two and a half feet. And it says here four times five, which means this is gonna be five, 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 and five. Therefore, this angle of this member or any member is gonna be how much? This angle is, Anyone remembers? 45. 45 degrees. So we're gonna see this angle is gonna be 45 degrees. Oh. This is typical, right? Of all angles. So your job here is try to find out F1, F2, and F3. Do the analysis for it. It's gonna be number one. Second item here to design this as tension member. Each one of these, look at the connection. 
Your gal here three quarter of an inch through bolt. So the bolt is gonna be cutting through the entire steel tube. So the steel tube is like a box section, right? You're gonna be cutting it twice. If you like, I can do here is give you the box, right? Steel tube. Here's another one. Give you something like this. I'm gonna be doing here through bolt. It's gonna be cutting through it. Meaning that I'm gonna have two holes, one here and one there. How is the hole diameter? I'm gonna say take this size and add one sixteenth of an inch to it. Okay. Now you can run your analysis for two equations. One of them is gonna be for the yielding, the other one is gonna be for the rupture, for the output. How about a net? I'm gonna say yes, a net. You can figure it out. How about the u factor? I want you guys to think here about the U factor. How much is going to be for a connection like this? We're going to have a couple of plates like this and a through bolt. You see here, it's interesting. And I have your two plates, one on each side. Because it says here, gusset plate half an inch each side. Is there any eccentricity between the load, between the steel tube and the plates? I'm going to say, where is this resultant force for the steel too? I'm going to say it's going to be right in the middle here. How about for the two plates? I'm going to say it's also going to be right in the middle here. So it's interesting. This X bar is going to be equal to zero. So your U factor is going to be equal to 1.0, right? But you need to write it down. You need to explain the reason. Any questions? For this one. When is due? What time? Sunday. 11.59 p.m. End of the night, of the evening. Any question on the homework or the lecture? Quick question. Do you have anything you can post to kind of like quickly review or help us review how to solve for the forces on this? Like how to on solve the trust? Forces? Trust yeah. answers? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'll give you something about trust answers. All okay. right. Thank you. That all previous uh, that'll forces. Help. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Should be a problem. Okay, guys, any questions? We are good. No class on Monday, correct? Um, unless you wanted to. <laughs> oh, we're good. <laughs> Okay, very good. And I have taken the attendance is right here. So everybody was here. I put present for him. So you guys should be finding this, right? All right. You guys enjoy the rest of the evening and uh, the long weekend. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Bye. Right. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Professor. Good night. Goodbye.